So let me introduce uh, today's uh, amplified lecture. It's a great honor for me to do so today. Uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have this series in our lives. Uh, the amplified series really aims to give a, a national platform and to initiate a, a national conversation candid conversations about race and diversity in STEM fields. It was launched in 2020 as part of the Gladstone Institute's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's held in partnership uh, with Georgia Tech Molecular Engineering and Sciences Institute at the University of Washington and the University of Texas at Austin. And I always like to give a shout out to Meg McDevitt, who uh, really has led this up and made it uh, into such an impactful series, along with uh, her great team, uh, including Lisa Cardi, uh, Giovanni, uh, and Adriana as well. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank Professor Manu Platt at Georgia Tech, Professor Tyrone Porter at uh, the University of Texas, and uh, Todd McDevitt at the Gladstone Institute and at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, who is uh, our team behind the scenes uh, to try to uh, make this everything it can be. So our goal has been to spark change uh, and to initiate action throughout the sciences and engineering to keep the Black Lives Matter at the forefront of everybody's thoughts um, over this year. Uh, the event's being live streamed on Facebook and it's also being recorded and uh, the recording will be available in about a week uh, on the Gladstone YouTube channel. This is a conversation and so we encourage you to submit questions anytime during the talk by using the Q&A button. Uh, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, please submit your questions in the chat and our moderator, um, myself and helpers, <laughs> will uh, share them uh, uh, with the speaker. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. You can also follow the conversation by using the hashtag uh, at Amplified STEM. Um, and also a plug for a uh, great next talk uh, on March 30th, the root of it, decolonizing curriculum and organizational practices in STEM with Skylar Walks from UT Austin that I, I think we're all really looking forward to. So for today, I couldn't be more excited to uh, introduce uh, Professor Lola Eniola Adefeso, uh, who I've admired from afar uh, for many years in my technical field, uh, but also uh, through her activities and actions. And I've gotten a chance to uh, meet her on Zoom, and I'm looking forward to giving her a big hug sometime when we can meet in person again. Uh, she is the University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor of Chemical Engineering and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, she uh, is quite the leader, as you'll see from this list. She's the Associate Director of the Cellular Biotechnology Training Program. She's Vice Chair for Graduate Studies in Chemie. Uh, and uh, she graduated from the program that we all admire uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, proud uh, graduate of UMBC with a bachelor's in chemical and biomolecular engineering. She earned her master's degree in 2000 and doctoral degree in uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. I started reading some of her papers way back then. It's been good to remind myself of that. Uh, her research interests is in the general area of biomaterials and drug delivery. Um, and the design and evaluation of particulate carriers, uh, particularly in the uh, hugely exciting area of vascular targeted delivery, uh, which is so important uh, throughout cancer and heart and lung diseases. Recent discoveries uh, from her lab have led to two uh, patent filings, and one of which has been licensed to an exciting new startup. It was great to uh, uh, find out about this, Orange Grow Bio. And so she's also the CSO uh, there. Um, in recognition of her pioneering research, she has received numerous research awards, including the NSF Career Award, the Lloyd Ferguson Young Investigator Award, 
uh, the American Heart Association and Innovator Award, Award and the BMES Mid Career Award, uh, uh, one of our uh, primary national uh, honors in our field. She's a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineers, AMB, um, and BMES. Uh, she's on the BTSS study section. I don't know how she is having all this time. You can see how amazing she is. <laughs> I'm running out of breath uh, here, Lola. Uh, and uh, her research is currently funded by multiple grants from the NIH, the AHA, and the uh, NSF. What we're here for today uh, is uh, another great example of her leadership. Uh, she's played a, a really outstanding role in leading, uh, uh, I would say, uncovering and illuminating systemic racism uh, issues that we, that we have really all over our field, um, but uh, most recently, uh, a hugely prominent and provocative commentary uh, in Cell. Um, and we're so excited to have you here to, to talk about this and, and we can, I, I'm sure we can have a good conversation around it in our time as well. I wanna give a, a call out to my colleague and good friend, her co-author Kelly Stevens here at, at UW, um, along with all of their collaborating co-authors who have done a great service uh, for all of us. And I, I just wanna use it as a call for action for all of us uh, the privileged um, in our field. Um, it's a call to action uh, and shines a light on NIH, but we well know that, that, that some of the lessons here will be valuable uh, throughout uh, our funding agencies and our, throughout our field. Lola, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on uh, and uh, looking for, forward to your uh, presentation and to the discussion afterward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Uh, uh, Pat, you're somebody that I deeply admire as well. And so I, I am honored uh, to have you uh, introduce me here. And um, uh, the fact that you've been reading my paper for that long, I, I'm gonna go scream off camera when I'm done. Uh, so it, I am delighted uh, for this opportunity that Gladstone has given me to talk about the work that we have been doing with my colleagues in biomedical engineering uh, faculty to try and uh, dismantle uh, this issue and barrier that's preventing uh, black scholars and as well as brown scholars from um, uh, persevering in STEM. But I thought that I'd start by um, sharing my personal journey. How did I get here? Who am I? Uh, to sort of motivate uh, the conversation that I hope that I would have with you guys. Uh, later on in the talk. So to start with, I was born in Silver Spring, Montgomery County, Maryland. Yes, I am a U.S. citizen by birth. I know many people <laughs> because of my accent have uh, threatened to deport me many times. And it also means that one day I too can be your president. So, so president of the United States, so watch out. All right, but I do, I uh, want to share where my accent comes from. It is, of course, a medley of many of the places I've lived over the years, but it is important to share that I, I did spend about 15 years of my life growing up in Ibadan, uh, a small city uh, in Nigeria. At 15, I moved back to the United States without my parents, uh, and I was joining my two older siblings who were 17 and 20 year old at the time. Again, we had no parents, so my 20-year-old brother was essentially the de facto parent uh, that we had. And before I uh, arrived, <laughs> I didn't realize this. They had gone and just rented an apartment. So I came in um, and immediately had to go to work. Because I was 15 going on 16, I had finished high school, but there was no mechanism to convince anyone in the United States that I'd done that. And so then Rather than going to college, I had to, or the, the university setting, I had to start at their local community college uh, in the Baltimore area. Uh, and there I lined up to be a pre-nursing uh, degree, right? Why nursing? Because that's what everybody around me told me that I could do. Um, 
that, you know, and so that that's what I was uh, signed up for. Uh, the idea being that you could do a quick two year degree and make money because uh, in our mindset, that was the most important thing to be able to lift ourselves out of uh, whatever financial situation we were at the time. And so, of course, I was also working. It turns out that my paycheck for my first, uh, my first McDonald's paycheck was what I was going to need to buy a car, a vehicle for myself and my siblings. It was a $500 car. It was a piece of junk. Uh, and that's what we had. And so the juggling of three young people living together, trying to pay rent, trying to go to school. We were all college age. We were all going to this community college. Uh, needless to say, there was not much in terms of motivation to be performing at the level that we all could, myself included. Um, there were a lot of times that a car were broken down. I remember an experience where we went to school and, and it was not clear how we were going to get back home because we didn't have a vehicle. And in Baltimore, where the, the transportation system is not uh, the best or robust, there was no connection of buses that could get us from school to home. And so our bright idea, we walked from school on the highway, took us about two hours to get home. Did it occur to us that this was a terrible idea? No. Did we get up and go to school the next day? Yes, because it's one of the few things that kept us going. The ability to be educated with the hope that one day we will get out of our current situation. And there was there were periods where we didn't have a place to live because there's only so much a 17 year old, a 16 year old, and a 20 year old can maintain and pay rent. And so there were times when my sister and I um, had all we had in our car, and we would go from one cousin's house to the other in hopes that when nightfall we can crash uh, at their house. But we get up the next day and we go to school. That that was our story uh, for a while. Until one day I was having a conversation, or the adults were having a conversation um, about computers. This was the era where computers engineering, Silicon Valley was booming and they were having conversations. And I jumped in and, and my cousin shown in this picture, or cousin-in-law anyways, um, looked at me, stopped the conversation. He looked at me and said, what are you studying in school? And I said, nursing pre-nursing and he's paused and, and said why not engineering you seem smart okay I, I sort of shrugged it up I didn't think about it um, until maybe another semester passed and I finally got into my biology course what you don't know is when you're in a community college and you're doing nursing the biology courses are the hardest ones to ever get into because everybody's pre-nursing so I got into the biology course and then all of a sudden I realized oh my god Biology is not my thing, at least not in the uh, way the pedagogy of biology is given. Uh, and so that's when that conversation of why not engineering popped back into my mind. And I did some digging and sure enough, I became an engineer. I transferred to UMBC, um, which was down the road from this community college that I was going. So I went to UMBC only because that's all I knew. I was going to transfer to a four-year college. And this was the college that was down the road from me. I did not realize that that decision was going to be used to judge my value for the rest of my academic career. Let me repeat that. I went to UMBC because it was down the road. I didn't have the resources or the time to do the legwork of going to any of those other colleges that were out of my proximity. Um, and so I went to UNBC. And this decision is going to be used to ju judge my value for the rest of my academic career. The other piece that I need to point out here, for me, the dorm, that was the first time I had stable housing. Nine months I had home that I could call mine and summer, the idea of summer used to give me palpitation because I had to figure out where I would live for that six months before school starts back up uh, again. 
I think that point is important, of course, because we all went through the pandemic where we had to shut down dorms and send people home right away, immediately without warning. There was somebody out there like me that did not know where to go. So at UMBC, life was great. The first semester with math and intro engineering classes, it was quite diverse than some of these classes. And, and in fact, I was taken aback because at the community college, it was mostly white women because it was a pre Muslim program that I was involved in. Uh, and so I was excited to see all these black people and they were all sitting in front and they were all smart. It was very interesting. I didn't realize why and I'll soon find out later. And then I got into the engineering class and the thing was flipped upside down. I was the only black student in my food mechanics class. The class was mostly white. Then all of a sudden, the stereotype thread starts to kick in. And I remember my first exam in this course. It was so bad, I did not even make the list of grades that the instructor put up. Okay, and I remember going back to my dorm room thinking, this is the end of my life. Obviously, I'm the only black student in that course. Maybe I don't belong in engineering. So I spent the night crying myself, wondering what I was gonna do next. And then I summoned up the courage to at least go inform my fluids instructor that I was going to leave uh, the program or at least the engineering program and find another major to do. Uh, that instructor was Julie Ross. So when I went to her, I remember going, I'm sorry, I just wanted to let you know I'm dropping out of engineering. It's not for me because this exam clearly shows that. And she busted out laughing and did not blink and said, of course you belong in engineering. Of course you can do it. Here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna come 30 minutes before class, every class. And you and I are gonna sit down and we're gonna go through the things that maybe uh, didn't quite make sense to you the class before, okay? So I stuck it out and I ended up uh, finishing. I still ended up getting them in the course. But I always wondered how come this woman uh, was so sure that I could do engineering. The other piece before I go on with my story to highlight here is I'm not sure that I would have gone to Julie Ross if she had been a man. I'm not sure, okay? I think there was some level of connection and comfort because she was a, a young uh, woman faculty uh, who was teaching it. It later occurred to me that the reason why she didn't blink when I said engineering was not for me, for her to say, uh-uh, of course engineering is for you is because she is not guessing, she is not extrapolating. She has seen someone like me succeed in engineering. And that's because in this image is her colleague, uh, Professor Janice Lumpkin, who was at the time an associate professor in her same department of chemical engineering and who was a mentor to Julie Ross, okay? So when I said I couldn't do engineering, she's laughing because she knows of course I could and she understood what I was in internalizing was not accurate. Okay, so again, she convinced me to stay and I finished. In moving through the career, again, it's still very isolating in engineering because I get throughout my coursework at UNBC, I was one of two in some of my in, uh, uh, chemical engineering courses. And I remember one day in the hallway, I'm walking from one class to the other and I'm overhearing other students have conversation about research. You gotta do research. If you don't do research, you're not gonna be able to get a job. You shouldn't. And here I am sweating and panicking going, oh my God, this is the first time I'm hearing about this research thing. I have to go do research. So the first thing I did when I got to my dorm is to go, okay, I need to go do research in chemical engineering. So I go to the chemical engineering website and I'm looking through and immediately I knew who I needed to contact. Yes, you guessed it, the black woman. This was the first time I had encountered uh, Professor Janice Lumpkin on this website. So I emailed her and I said, hey, I'm told I need to do research. Otherwise, I'm not going to get a job. Can I do research with you? She, of course, said, why don't we have a meeting? So who is Janice Lumpkin? Janice Lumpkin was one of the first Black female uh, chemical engineering professor at 
uh, in the United States. She was an undergrad uh, in chemical engineering from MIT, and then she later went and got a PhD uh, at UPenn. Uh, then before she started her academic career, she worked in the industry for a couple of years, but somehow she wanted to come back to teach because of her own experience as a black student, not ever having any faculty member that looked like him. She wanted to come back. And in some ways, I think she needed to come back for me to be here to give you this talk uh, that I'll have this conversation with you here today. The other thing that struck me about Janice's interaction with me, again, I cold called, called her. Uh, she does not know me. I don't even know if she remembers my name in the conversation. And there was nothing and no point in that conversation where she asked for my high school, my uh, resume, my GPA, my career goal, none of those. She just said, why do you wanna do research? I told her, and then she said, okay, good. Why don't you show up at room 401 on Monday and ask for graduate student X? Good luck. That was it. Okay, so I, I did research with her and it was through that experience that I found out about graduate school. There's this PhD thing that you can do that pays you money to go get additional degree. Who wouldn't want to sign up for that? I just like sign me on. In that process, of course, uh, Janice was also the person who introduced me to the My Home Scholarship Program, which is this renowned program at UMBC that's been credited for uh, 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 leading to the highest numbers of Black uh, scholars getting PhDs and MD and MD PhD degrees. Uh, for me, it was my own mini HBCU experience because here I am in the middle of this majority uh, university and there is this collection of scholar. At the time, the program was limited to African-Americans and it was funded by uh, Robert and Jane Meyerhoff uh, who donated money for this. And, and Robert Myoff was motivated by this idea when he heard that this, this notion that Blacks could not do engineering, could not do sciences, could not get higher degree because they just weren't good enough. He hypothesized that, no, I don't think that's the case. I think if I would treat the students like my own children and give them resources and access, I suspect that they too can do this. And so he uh, uh, got with uh, President Freeman Rabowski and they started this program and he funded it. Uh, the first year they brought in only male, uh, black uh, uh, males. And then the next year they opened it up um, to uh, women. And so through Janice Lumpkin, and I was admitted into this program. And I remember going to my first family meeting. This is the meeting where all of the scholars on campus come we hear updates, people talk and things like that. And at the end of every meeting, Freeman always gets up and have all of us get up and recite, hold fast to dream. But if dream dies, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dream for when dream goes, life is a broken field, frozen with snow. I remember just bawling, crying, because this was the first time this idea of dreaming was connected to education for me. I've been somebody who was always interested in science and how the world works and how the body works. And this is the first time that a collection of 100 plus Black people were basically saying to me, you can dream. It was a profound experience for me. And the picture above is the a picture of my graduating class. And somewhere in there is my tiny bud head graduating with a bunch of individuals who are now MDs and PhDs and professors at, all across this country of ours. UFBC, of, uh, of course, and the Maya program gave us uh, uh, Dr. Kizzy Colbert, who has been instrumental in the uh, coronavirus uh, vaccine that we have today. So this is a program that, again, is, is, has had impact in our nation. She's of course not the only alumni that we got that we know. Um, Adams, Dr. Adams, our uh, Surgeon General, also uh, was a Meyerhoff alum and he's the a, a, a part of the family uh, for better or worse. Okay, so uh, I finished UMBC, research was great. I signed up um, to 
do graduate school. I remember applying to top programs across the country um, and getting into many of them and recruiting weekend started, I was excited. And then I started to notice a pattern. I was one of two in most graduate recruiting weekend in some ways is one of one. And in some places I feel like zero of one because you know, I just didn't feel seen. So then again, this stereotype threats start to come back again. Maybe graduate school is not for me. Everybody here is, is white uh, for, for better or worse. And then I got to Penn's recruiting weekend. One of the things that Penn was doing at the time that ended up working out well for me was the fact that it wasn't a group visit, it was individual visit. So I went as an individual to visit and a lot of the attention was focused on, on chatting with me. Uh, Dan Hammer was the graduate chair at the time and it turned out he had broken his back. Um, and so he wasn't available, but I remember them putting me on the phone with him and I was on the phone for an hour and I'm sitting there thinking there is this professor who's sitting on the phone for one hour trying to convince me to come to this place. That's interesting. That was an experience that I did not get from many of the other places. Many of them were top uh, 10 programs in chemical engineering at the time. But there was another thing that I didn't realize about Penn at the time that ended up leading me to go to Penn. I left the recruiting weekend still not sure that I would go to Penn. Why? Because You've been, you've been told that you have to go to the best run program and Penn at the time was about uh, 28, I think, uh, in the Kenny ranking. I remember going back to my dorm, thinking about this later, um, about three, four weeks after my last visit, I, I, I got a letter in the mail to my dorm and it was from Dan Hammond. And in this letter, he again convinced or worked to convince me that Penn was where I needed to go. And then in the second paragraph, I got the information that I did not know. He said, Janice was a graduate of our program. And if she were here today, I'm sure she would tell you Plant Penn is the place to be. Okay, so at this point, Janice Lumpkin had passed away. She died maybe six or seven months into me working with her um, from childbirth, okay? Uh, she developed a pulmonary embolism uh, and dies weeks later, okay? What I did not realize also was that Julie Ross, in writing my letters of recommendation for graduate school, had gone and, and, and uh, requested the letter that Janice wrote for the Meyerhoff and was including that in, um, the, in my graduate letters. So Penn, of course, wanted me there because they knew if Janice Lumpkin was saying this things about me that I belong at Penn, okay? And so when you get back in a letter, what do you do? You have to go to Penn, okay? So again, this encounter with Janice is altering my path in ways that I could not have imagined. And Penn ended up being the best thing uh, that I did, okay? I'm here because I went to Penn. And then of course I went and worked with Dan Haber. And I, again, wanna highlight some of the important things that happened with my interaction at Penn that led me again to be here today giving you this talk, is that in that lab, I was just a graduate student, I just another graduate student. It was not about this color of my skin. Uh, Dan, as an advisor, was great at many things, maybe some things he could work on, but he was an advisor that treated me like a human being. He did not expect more from me he did not expect less from me. Every issue that I dealt with in his lab, he dealt with it in the way that he would deal with any graduate student. When I was unruly, like any good academic parent, he offered to buy me a computer. <laughs> I, took the, I took the offer. But importantly, the way he communicated to me that he uh, see value in me were the ways that were not uh, shakeable. For example, he sent me to give a conference in my second year in the Netherlands. This was an invited conference that he could not make. Who does that? Who sends a little black girl to a conference to give an invited talk uh, instead of them themselves, right? And you can imagine <laughs> the shock and awe of the conference people when I showed up instead of the white male Dan Hammond that they were, they, they were expecting. 
Uh, so again, those are those experiences that stick to you in terms of an advisor that sees you, that sees your value, that really is able to, uh, again, put their confidence uh, behind you. Uh, so then, of course, because of that wonderful experience I had and the exposure, I was plugged into the chemical engineering uh, discipline. And I would go to the uh, AICHE meetings uh, every um, year. And in there was when I connected with others uh, like me, uh, who were also faculty member in chemical engineering. I remember Christine Grant, the first AICHE that I went, in the hallway, this woman beelines to me, hey, who are you? What are you doing here? Are you a student? What, you know, and oh, I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering. Come, come with me. And you know, it almost feels like you're being ushered into this narrow high uh, hallway in, in, in AICHE to meetings where they were gathering and meeting. And it basically was a, a minority faculty uh, program at um, AICHE. And so there I connected with Gilda uh, Barlito, Paula Hammer, and Lance Collins. And every year I would see them and they would ask my progress and, and so on and so forth. And those interactions were important in my ability to, to keep going in the pipeline. And then at some point in my fourth year, I encountered Julie at the AICHE conference and she said to me, I need to chat with you. I, I went and she said, I think you need to consider being a faculty member. And as soon as she said that, I didn't even think twice because of course I have seen a faculty member that looked like me, Janice Lumpkin. And so I said, sure. And I went back to Penn and I said to Dan, I'm applying for faculty positions and that was it. Okay, so I put my application out as a first fourth year student uh, to many programs. And I was thankful that there were a few of them who were open-minded enough to interview a fourth year graduate student. I remember, <laughs> Dan running and saying, oh, Michigan, Ron Larson called and, and he wanted to just know if you were good. Um, and, and so then I got the interview and I'm deeply appreciated of the uh, experience there uh, at Michigan as well. So I accepted the offer at Michigan uh, because in my view, compared to many of the other places that I interviewed at, uh, Michigan seemed to be where I, I was going to be most welcome. At the time I was interviewing, 0% of the departments that I interviewed at had a minority faculty, okay? Everybody was white, everybody was Asian, right? And so then Michigan was the first, in, last interview I did, and it was the first one where they had minority faculty. And I could tell the difference in how they interacted with me uh, compared to many of the other programs that I interviewed at. So I ended up going to, to Michigan. I started my career there in 2006. And of course, the first thing you do is you wanna plug in into your community. Uh, AICHE uh, was a great uh, place to do that when you're in a chemical engineering program. And I would go every year, but my first meeting was important. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, again, when you were one of a few the thing that should, that's supposed to excite you, like going to a conference, can be daunting because you are going to have seven days, at least AICHE felt that way, where you are basically a minority nonstop and people zooming in on you, wondering whether you are a janitor or a secretary, did you get lost, things of that nature. But for me, what I wanted was uh, a, a way to connect. And I remember looking for a roommate and I asked some of my ex lab mates and they recommended me some random ladies that I'd never met who were also starting off as a faculty member, uh, Tatiana Segura and Angie Kinnear. And I connected with them and roomed with them. And it was one of the most open, it's like we you know, were separated from birth or something in terms of how they included me. And, and that process actually has been very, uh, uh, important uh, to, to keeping me going uh, to AICG. But the other piece that I want to highlight about my first AICG was my interaction with uh, Professor Nicola Peppers. I had uh, connected with her because she was a mentor. Again, Julie Ross, this fluids instructor, uh, was an undergrad at Purdue when Professor Peppers was there. And so we had interacted because we were nominating her for some sort of award. And so then I remember having a conversation about meeting him 
at the conference, at my first uh, conference. And so we set up a time to meet at, at one of those receptions and I show up. And before I could open my mouth, he looked at me and said, Amalola, come here, listen, let me tell you something. The important piece there was that he said my name. Right. This is, and please recognize how important this is. This was a leader in our field. Somebody that I've admired and watched it from afar did not start the conversation with, how do you say your name or any of those things? He had gone and learned how to say my name, my full name. That is inclusion. That brings you in. That makes, that makes you feel uh, like you matter. And so that again, I say that because many of, of you here on this on this webinar are academics. It, it is important when you go that extra mile to learn your student name. So what else do I do to, to still be here? Sulk it. You know, I still myself am not immune to the feeling of being one of the few. And every now and then, before I go out of my house to go out there what seemed like a war zone, I give myself a pep talk. I look in the mirror and I say, you are just gorgeous. You are just smart. You can do this. And I go out. I still encounter racial aggression. I still encounter bias. I still encounter hostile interaction. Um, it, it, you know, it happens. But I develop, again, a mechanism to cope with it. For me, it's basically getting a battle song in my head that I sing every time I encounter those interactions. M-E-T or me, or we shall be one. Let me say that again. M-E-T or me, or we shall be one. That's a Yoruba song, and it really says when you don't see me, you are not seeing the work of God. And so then it allows me to crack and say, when you're acting a fool because of my skin color or because you don't think I belong, it is your loss. It is your problem. And so then I move on. Okay, so here is my story. I joined the department in 06. I was tenured in 13, promoted to full in 2017, the first African-American woman to do so in my department. Levi Thompson was the first African-American to do it in that department. It's important to highlight though that I am the last BIPOC faculty hired by that department, my department. And I'm only the second African-American woman in the history of the College of Engineering at Michigan to attain the full professor. And that's still the case in 2020, okay? That is the uh, story. And here is the summary of my village. I could not have done any of this without Janice Lumpkin. I needed to see her. I could not be here without the support of Gilda Barbino, Christine Grant, Paula Hammond, Levi Thompson, Guillermo Amir, at, at, and Professor Collins. Okay, I needed that. But this group of individuals above, they supplemented and, and included me. And that is why I am it. So where are we now today? This is the US demographics. I need you to remember Latinx, Hispanics, 18.5% of the population, Black Americans, African Americans, 13.4%. This is what the engineering faculty looks like. Throughout the country, only 2.5% of faculty members are African-American. Only 3.7% are Hispanic, Latinx, American, okay? And no, younger faculty are not more diverse. That's the first myth that we hear. Look at that. That number is just the same at the assistant professor level for both uh, ethnic uh, and racial group. And that's not the case when you look at the number of women. Women's uh, percentage in the fact engineering faculty has steadily increased and there's more women at the assistant level than there are 
the other lens. This is not the case for uh, racial diversity. And when you zoom in on universities that have the largest uh, faculty member, this is the top 10, Georgia Tech being the, the uh, largest, you see there that out of 550, uh, 574 faculty, Georgia Tech has 39 underrepresented minority and only 21 uh, uh, black faculty. Now, Georgia Tech has the highest number of African American on their faculty in engineering, but that number is still only 3% of their faculty. And this is important because Georgia Tech is one of the sponsors of this talk, which I'm deeply appreciative of. But Georgia Tech is still underperforming for a university that is located in a majority minority city in Atlanta. Okay, so that's where we are. If the university is not on this list, it's because they have less than eight African American faculty. Surely there are more Black faculty at HBCU. That is also a myth. Okay, Morehouse, one of the uh, most prominent uh, HBCU has less than 15% URM. That's all of underrepresented minority, not just black. Okay. And here are some of your top universities' IVs. This is the number of African American faculty that they have as well. It's not just engineering. When you look at uh, medicine, the number uh, is not better. Only 4% of doctors are black. This, this are the numbers for now, not 50 years ago. Only 4% of doctors are black. And we know that many of them, based on recent studies, still hold negative stereotypes against blacks. Okay, for example, they think residents, medical residents think that our skin as black people are thicker. And so therefore our pain threshold is higher. This is current belief by uh, clinicians that I go to and, and treat that and be treated. So this is a major problem that we still have. And why should you care? Why should we care? When we don't have diverse faculty in STEM, then we don't train diverse workforce. There is studies and studies over and over again that people don't succeed or stay in disciplines that they don't see people like them. I am here today because from day one, I saw people like me, okay? And so the data is clear. Indeed, for the last decade, we've had this flat line of African-Americans that you're given bachelor's degree in engineering to, only 4%. That number is not far from the fraction that they are in the faculty, okay? It doesn't get better at the PhD level. Again, flatline. Since 2011, we've been graduating about 3.84% PhD to African American and Black. Okay. So basically, our workforce in engineering is not diverse. Why should you care? Lack of diversity in engineering is why we end up with racist technologies that we see and we were talking about all of this summer. For example, the pulse oximeter that we were using in COVID to measure oxygen levels. Clinicians were using this to decide who needs to be admitted for COVID and who has enough oxygenation level to go home. Turns out this machine was not accurate in black skin. Why do you think that is? Because probably the engineering team and the design team at every level probably did not have racial diversity. So it did not occur to somebody to calibrate the equipment on black skin. Did they forget to calibrate on black skin or did they calibrate on black skin and didn't think that the difference was important yet people were sent home and they died at home because of the technology that people trusted to be working for all of us. We hear now of algorithms that New York hospitals were using that were basically prioritizing white um, patients for treatment, despite the fact that the black patients in many cases were sick. Okay, so those are all things that are as the result of not having a diverse workforce. 
is we bake in the racism into our technology. The other piece is equity and access. We all spent the summer being upset at the event that led to the murder of George Floyd in broad daylight for all of us to see and played over and over again. And of course, the conversation that ensued afterwards of the lack of equity and lack of access. And somehow we're not recognizing that the lack of diversity in engineering faculty and the lack of diversity, uh, diversity in the workforce is directly linking to that. Okay, Black and Latinos are twice as likely to die from COVID. And Native Americans are more likely to be hospitalized during this pandemic. And it's relating to the fact that when they're not in STEM jobs, they don't have access to the high paying job. Engineering is still one of the top paying disciplines that we have out there, okay? So if I don't have high quality job, I don't have the high quality housing. Many of us still live in multi-generational houses. Many of us don't have access to jobs that give us healthcare. Many of us don't have access to healthy food. We live in food desert because grocery stores wouldn't come to our neighborhoods. So then that leads to this racial inequity in health because we are not doing preventative care. Who has that time? Who has that access? I mean, my husband just did a colonoscopy where they require somebody to be with you for the entire six hour period. So who has that flexibility to now find somebody else? We just won't be able to do this. And that of course leads to the uh, desperate impact of the pandemic and the social uh, instability that resulted from that. So. Again, this lack of diverse faculty leads to lack of diverse workforce, leads to health disparity, wealth disparity, that leads to social unrest that we experience, and the exaggerated impact of COVID-19 on this community in the United States. But there's also other things that we need to think about. Many people on this webinar might be thinking, well, you know, it's just Black people. Uh, you know, maybe we're okay with that, but the bottom line of our universities is about to be hit by this as well. This is what the high school population is going to look like in the next 10 years. It's going to be majority minority. And if we continue to have universities who are not equipped to service diverse population, they won't come. You will not compete well for them. And we all know what happens when tuition dollars drop off the cliff. You're gonna get higher increase, you're gonna get cuts. So this will affect our own bottom line as academics if we don't um, uh, begin to pay attention. Okay, last piece that I wanna highlight of this big issue with lack of diversity in STEM faculty is this simple fact that diverse faculty tackle diverse problems because we bring our own lived experiences into our research. For example, sickle cell disease primarily affects Blacks, okay, people of African and Middle Eastern origin. And the biomedical engineers that I know that study uh, sickle cell disease are all Black. Gilda Barabino, uh, Manu Flat, um, and myself as well. And Gilda was one of the first uh, biomedical engineers who really was started to apply engineering skills to understand how sickle cell, red blood cells move in blood and, and adhere to the vascular wall. So, some of the work that she's done, of course, is what Manu and I have, have built up on and started to sort of expand in many ways. My point being that when you don't have diverse STEM faculty, they are not there to research and study issues and, and, and um, um, diseases that affects them. So this issue of lack of diversity goes beyond just universities. Then we all of a sudden have to start thinking about our medical treatment, healthcare treatment, and our research institutes that are outside our university. And I cannot in good conscience continue this talk without highlighting that this is the Gladstone investigator webpage. This is what it looks like, okay? I cannot see um, any that is of a racial minority, okay? I understand that Gladstone cares deeply about this. I wouldn't be here giving this talk otherwise, and I know that they have done new things along um, making available postdoctoral fellowship for racial minority students, but the big pie 
is your investigator? What kind of medical research are they doing if there are no ethnic uh, diversity? Are they working on problems for all Americans? You need to ask that question and you need to answer that question. And here are the top uh, NIH researchers. This is what we, again, investigator demographic looks like. You need to ask the question, are they working on problems that benefits all Americans? This is uh, HHMI. This is an institute whose mission is to advance basic biomedical research and science to benefit all, all humanity. Three out of 254 investigators are Black. That's about uh, 1%, okay? So again, what problems are they working on? Would it benefit all of humanity? Those are the questions we need to start asking because again, diverse faculty work on diverse problems that benefit diverse people. So the summary here is that we need to care when there is not diversity in our staff. And this summer, again, during that period of, of unrest and pain that African-Americans were feeling in this country, with uh, the murder of George Floyd, I started to uh, have conversations with my colleague in biomedical engineering. Uh, this were women faculty that we were in the group with, and we started to immediately link this problem to our own discipline, that we are biomedical engineering faculty, we make technology, medical technology. This will impact society and we're not diverse. And so we decided to form a working group to ask the question, why is there a lack of diversity? And more, more importantly, what can we do about it? It doesn't take long to run into the net. Uh, well, we can't find them to hire. Well, that's the myth. We know that uh, in 2019, for example, we graduated 850 PhDs, Blacks, 500, that's male, 500 uh, 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 um, female uh, PhD African American. So they, they, that's over, uh, over a thousand um, students that were graduating the same thing with Hispanic and Latinx as well. So that's a myth. We're not finding them because we're not looking hard enough. And then you hear that maybe they're not good enough to, for what we want to hire. And my question is, really? I just told you as an undergrad, I was practically homeless with my luggage. I walked highways to go to school. Please understand when that Black student is showing up in your PhD program, they are the best of the best. They've got grit. They, they can do it all. And so if you are thinking they're not good, I would argue that your bar for measuring goodness is off. Okay, so the real thing, the real deal is climate. The reason why they're not there and they're not uh, uh, making it through is climate. They don't want faculty job because they see what appears to be the brutal environment that people that look like them are subjected to. And in many of their cases, they would have gone through their entire academic career not seeing a faculty member that looks like them. So by default, the understanding is that this is not a career for them. But then you have to think about burnout, overwork, and the appreciation uh, that faculty of color, the few that are there, the three percenters, uh, are dealing with tokenism, being dumped on all kinds of committee, being called on to do work, diversity work, and things like that, that are not rewarded, okay? Uh, mentoring, and some of the times we mentor across institutions, okay? Many, many Black scholars will be mentoring some of your students in your home institution without pay, without recognition. And then the double work and, and stress associated with teaching. But in many of our conversations, this funding story started to pop up because we had black women in our group and who were uh, describing the horror and how much writing of grants they have to get. And it didn't take long for us to remember this paper that came out at, at Genter uh, in, in 2011 that essentially documented and characterized funding disparity in, um, in racial uh, bias in NIH funding. They look at data from 2000, 2000 to 2006 of who was submitting ROIs, who was funded with ROIs, and they found that there was a gap, a 13.2% gap to be precise between funding of black applicant application versus white. So basically the black scholars and applicants were getting 55% less 
uh, fondly. And when you correct for publication record, meaning a black PI with the same record as a white PI, same background, same type of employer, meaning R1 university, the funding gap still remain. Okay, so it's real. And what does it mean? It means promotion and tenure because we know that these are all things that people look at when uh, we uh, make those decisions because the assumption is that if you don't get funded, especially with R01, that's the big pie for biomedical researchers, that you must not be good. That's the assumption that the tenure community is, is making, but nothing in this data justifies that assumption, this funding gap persisted even with the same quality of investigator from the black, uh, African-American black. Which means they have to write more, spending more time writing. Because they're writing so much, they're less productive. You're not able to write papers or, or do research because you're writing and you're not getting the money. If you're not getting the money, you're not able to get the big, shiny data that you need to get in those high uh, ranking publication. So it all builds up. And before you know it, no publication record, no citation, all of the above, you lead to uh, many of these scholars not getting tenure. Some of them just up and quit meaning before. What's frustrating is that that study came out in 2011 in the paper and nothing was done. Okay. Well, how do I know nothing was done? Well, fast forward to 2020, another analysis, this time looking at 2014 to 16. The funding, funding gaps still persisted. And it was frustrating to us going through the data over the summer because when you make a brief calculation of how much it would take to correct the gap, it's a tiny little dot compared to the NIH budget. And this was based on the uh, knowledge that only 2%, about 2% of the applicants to NIH were Black in that 2014 2016 year. And so that the amount to correct it is about the equivalent of having each of those NIH institutes funding two additional black uh, grants. Okay, so we were fired up. And so this collection of excellent scholars, many of them uh, badasses in their own right, um, we got together and we said, we need to do something, we need to write something. And, and you know, I show this image of all of them here and they're all smiley. But I promise you, this was not how we looked or felt during that time. In fact, for me, this was more accurate of what we looked, how we were feeling. We were fired up, we were ready to go. Yes, they're all black women in this image because in my mind, everybody should be a black woman because black women are fierce. They are smart, they are beautiful, they are, um, as good as it gets, right, in my mind. And this is important here to sort of take a step back and call out the extra burden that Black women face in academia. Their story is different, not in a good way from the rest of the minority, both personally and professionally. Uh, we're dealing with not just being Black, but also being woman. So it's an added stress that we feel professionally. And believe it or not, we are called on more to mentor, even more so than the black men. So black women scholars and, and faculty members are mentoring everybody. And in my mind, it's no different from what they were doing in black women during the era of slavery, where they were having the responsibility of feeding, literally breastfeeding everybody's babies. Okay, this is what's happening still with our Black women faculty members. In it. So they, there's this enormous isolation they also feel because everybody thinks of them as unicorns and weird things that they don't quite know what to do, to do with. But it doesn't end there. When we go home, because many of us are living in small towns where we all decided to put universities in, then our lives were still at the bottom of the pile in our social lives, right? I still have to deal with racial bias at the swimming pool with my child or the soccer fields uh, with my child. Even the issue of my hair, for example, can't find a hairdresser for days in Ann Arbor. That's why my hair looks like this. It's, it's a survival mode mechanism. People go, oh, your hair looks nice. I go, yeah, it came out of survival because it was either I drive to Detroit 
um, to do my hair or find a hairstyle that I can do uh, by myself. So the, 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 the stress that, that Black men in, in the academy feel is double. And, and you know, it, it always makes my blood boil when people go, but Ann Arbor is such a great town. And it is. It's such a liberal town. And it is. And it's the best place to raise the children. And it is. The problem is those experiences are from the majority experience. This is what Ann Arbor Public School looks like. The demographics of the district is very close to the U.S. demographics, right? At least for the black. But look at the green slice of the pie. As you go from algebra in eighth grade, all of a sudden to calculus, where did all the black students go? That is my black son. That's not in my calculus class. This is their disciplinary pattern, and the pie does the opposite. The green slice gets bigger. In school suspension, forty-four percent of black students are suspended, despite only being 14% of the school. And it, this story goes on. That is my black son that would be suspended. So then someone like me is forced to say, I don't think I can afford my mental stress to have my kid be in the Ann Arbor Public School, despite being one of the best school districts in the world. And I'm gonna have to spend money that I don't have for private school. Okay, and this is what life looks like in black women in that gallery. Look at white women and other women, 20% of faculty in, in non-URM university. This is what the numbers look like for minority women, okay. All right, so there is a big issue with NIH funding and we need to fix this, okay. So we got together and we wrote um, this article and in there we go through a list of things that we think NIH needs to do right away. And I'm going to spend the next couple of slides and then I'm done um, to sort of walk you through what we were thinking in those recommendations. The first being, of course, we ask that NIH acknowledge the presence of racism in, um, uh, in their system, okay? It's important because this summer we spend time talking about the systemic racism in higher education. We, we had about 10,000 plus people signed this and it was published in science. And so if it's in academia, and NIH primarily runs their study section with academics, then how can they, those two not be connected? So we ask NIH to give us data. What fraction of your scientific review officers are ethnic minorities? What fraction of program officers? And what fraction of your panel? Okay. And then we ask NIH to just simply fix this problem Hashtag fund black scientists, just fund them. Um, and, and we say this because we know NIH can move when the data came out that young investigators were not getting a fair shake in the NIH system. NIH instituted the early stage investigator program right away. They did not do extra studies. They just did it because they knew that having a robust pipeline of scholars would strengthen our biomedical enterprise. So why not do that for racial inequity? Why not? And again, I highlighted that this disparity remains regardless of career stage. So there are issues that are linked to bias in here. We just don't want to talk about it. This is the K99 data, right? Success rate for white scholars is better than for black scholars and is statistically significant. So this myth. The first thing people tell me is, well, let's just use the ESI mechanism. No, it's, it's still biased based on race, okay? And so then we ask NIH, if there are policies like this R21 for investigators from diverse background that we know at least two of your institutes have, okay? And I show it here, the purpose of this funding opportunity is to provide support for new investigators from backgrounds nationally underrepresented in biomedicine and behavioral research. If we can do that at the R21 level with a couple of institutes, why not at the R1 level? And why not at all institutes? We would love for NIH uh, to tell us this, okay? The other piece of it is we ask them to diversify the study section and do it right away. Why? Because we know, and I've made the case early on, that diverse team generates the most creative, innovative and impactful solution. 
our study section are still by and large mostly white men and Asian. Okay. So then if the study sections are not diverse, what then is the result of the solution that they end up with in terms of what grants that they think are exciting or not? Are they the most creative? Are they the most innovative? We'll never know, right? So we ask for them to bring um, the study section to critical mass. And our colleague, uh, Taffy and, and Gilpin make this argument that it's needs to go beyond just representing the diversity of the current biomedical faculty. It has to be the diversity of the United States because of course, NIH is funding grants that is meant to generate solutions, biomedical solutions for all Americans. Concerns, where are we gonna find all these black scholars? Why, where are we gonna find all these Native American and, and Hispanic scholars? Well, let's look beyond academia. Okay, there are PhDs that we are granting to these people, they're just not in academia, they go in the industry. And since biomedical technology that we make end up being developed by many of these industrial partners, why not bring them into the review process? That's how you get close to your 13%. We need to make diversity a score driving um, um, mechanism, okay? We all talk about diversity drives innovation. And our age in its goal says that he wants to, they want to first that fundamental creative discovery, innovative research. Hello, you cannot get the peak of innovation unless you have diverse people working. Okay. So then concerns, the biggest concerns I've heard from colleagues is, well, if you force people to start getting scored by diversity, they're going to just be putting all kinds of black people on their proposals. And I say, what's the problem? <laughs> Well, maybe black people are going to be tired. Well, that would be a great problem to have. Why don't we get there first and we deal with it? But the other thing is this notion that it's a bad thing to just put people on your proposal who don't belong there. But guess what? It's already happening. Okay, this is a study that just came out uh, where uh, Kate uh, Clancy and her team looked at uh, talking to women of color, and this came out. They're putting each other on grants for no reason, and even if their research areas are completely different, just so that they could help each other. It's already happening, it's just not happening to scholars of color. So this will even the same field. And the worst thing that can happen here is people might discover that their black colleagues can do research. Okay, then the other piece of this is, of course, we say fund black scientists, right? prioritize diverse teams for funding, just fund them, okay? And one of the ways we need you to do this is to have all applications from black investigator be discussed, right? People are going to be like, no, you can't do that. And that's preferential treatment. We know from follow-up studies that the biggest group of reasons why the funding gap exists is this study section, the discussion, who gets discussed and who does not get discussed in the sport we get. So we say just fund black scientists. And before we all scream of the extra proposal that we're going to have to discuss, it's only about 2% of the application pool that's black. That's about two additional applications that you have to read if you're reading 100 to begin, or if you get 100 in that study section. So it's just two more. Do it. Okay. The next level that ties in is this idea that NIH funding decisions are not necessarily done by scores. Yes, everybody that gets the score below the pay line is automatically in line for funding and most of them will get funding. But there are discretion that the program officers have to fund and it happens all the time. In the study that Drug Monkey did of the data, from this HOPE study in 2019, he found that the, the highest score that a, a Black grant was funded was 34%. Beyond that, there were no Black uh, PI grants that were funded. Yet, between 35, 35% and 59%, 119 applications from white PIs were funded. Okay, why is this important? This is discretionary decision that the POs and the councils for each institute have. So how is it okay 
to make discretionary decisions that benefits one race, and we are all going to be upset because we say fund black scientists. So this kinds of preferential treatment by race is already happening. It's just biasing positively for one race and leaving the rest of us behind. Okay. So for you on this call who are faculty members, what can you do? We need to look at ourselves. How are we judging biostructures? How are we reacting to people's names? Because all of those things feed into how we're scoring them. We just need to be uh, cognizant of that. And I want you to value diversity of the team. There is data out there now that shows without any doubt that diverse team leads to innovative and most creative solution. So you can value the diversity of the team when you do that investigative sport section score. Look for women, BIPOC, disability, gender minority. The more people of different background you put, put together, the high performing that team is going to be. And, you know, this also sips in, in another way because I hear people saying, well, I'm not racist. And, and when I score this grant, I don't even know what the racial makeup of the person I'm reading their grant. That's good. But I promise you, somebody else in your study session knows. And their knowledge and your lack of knowledge comes to a head in this uh, funding disparity. And the other place where this uh, manifests itself is these bar and how we apply them. So it's not that people are racist, it's that they're just more likely to apply that high bar when it's the other. This is a, a, a Twitter conversation by Makeda Stevens, a, a student that I met when she was a master's student at U of M. She's not a PhD student at U of M. This is a story that came out of this vaccine blunder in Philadelphia, where they gave this novice guy um, the contract to vaccinate Philadelphians. Of course, it all went wrong. It, as far as I knew, we took all the money and, and cut. Okay, here's Makeda, also 22. She's saying, I was 22, I was building an NPO based off of six years of national and international experience, one of a handful of subject matters across the world and I was laughed out of the room and denied funding, even after I demonstrated results without funding. This is the experience of Black women. This is the experience of Black men in the academia. We always are asked to prove it, whereas the majority get the benefit of the doubt. How many of you have heard that phrase? It's not said in the proposal, but the, this this team will figure it out. Ask yourself, what is the demographics and the gender makeup of the PI of the grants that you most likely to hear that phrase? Okay, so that's how it manifests. You need to be cognizant of that. Speak up, speak out, and be an ally. When you hear those kinds of positive bias, push back against that. Okay, because if you want to claim fairness, then every proposal has to be given a fair shape. Don't ask more of, of minority PIs than you were as majority PI. And when you go back into your daily lives and your writing proposals, cite black and brown people. Equitably, we know this, that despite publication at the same level of journalists, they don't get the same level of citation as majority. And please do not wait for an age to force you to put diverse flowers on your Team. If you have African American, Hispanic, uh, Latinx, Native American uh, faculty colleagues, get to know them, figure out their research, include them in your team. This is part of how you change the climate in your department that's going to keep the scholars within. Okay. Uh, lack of diversity impacts all of us. I hope I've made that case to you, and I hope that you will take this call that we encourage from this paper to call your Congress people and bring this to their attention. We need this change, we need this now, okay? A singular bar for excellence is not consistent with diversity. We need to keep this in mind as we go to the faculty circle. So my final thought, fund black scientists, fund brown scientists, fund indigenous uh, scientists, right? Because 
this paper and, and this call focused on Black scholars and Black PIs because that's the data we have. NIH could not give the uh, data for Indigenous uh, faculty members because the number is so low, it would de-identify them. So one can be rest assured that there's some level of disparity that's happening there, we just don't have the data. So this is not to say that they are not feeling the pain as well. So I want to highlight this and, and, and call that out uh, so you all uh, know. Pay attention to your women of color uh, uh, faculty members. They are feeling the added burden of the duality of their um, existence. Include them, look them in the eye, do not gaslight them. And then I highlight uh, a couple of readings, uh, this uh, paper that came out uh, by my colleague, Michael Taffney, they really did a good deep dive into this NIH data and break down a lot of the issues that I highlight in this talk. And I recommend uh, reading uh, Dr. Ebony McGee's latest book that talks about how some of our action is part of how uh, we are really preventing diversity in academia. So with that, thank you so much. I hope we have time to take questions. This sort of went a little longer than I anticipated. Thank you. We could listen to you all day, Lola. Thank you so much. It was an incredible journey first, uh, and then uh, so many important issues that you've highlighted that intermingle in a systemic uh, sense uh, for the second part of your talk. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna take a, the moderator's privilege and, and start uh, with a question that I've been thinking a lot about on more on the second part of your talk. Uh, and it, it has to do with another aspect at NIH where there's these special programs uh, that direct funding toward you know, areas that are deemed important. And you touched upon some of the problems uh, with the system that, that don't identify funding for problems like sickle cell. Uh, and other types of diseases or technologies that disproportionately impact our, our black and brown communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, this is sort of a, a question of also then higher up, how do we get diverse voices at NIH, at the staff leadership, and even council level where those kind of decisions are made to create RFPs, which seems you know, an obvious place where systemic racism is causing problems? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And you know, the simple answer is to fund black scientists. Why do I say that? Many of these positions are filled with people based on their accolades and success, right? NIH program directors are former scientists, right? Uh, leaders of NIH themselves are former successful PIs, right? And so black scholars are not getting funded. They're not getting tenure. Many of them are stuck at the associate levels. They will not be invited to these leadership positions. So their voices are not gonna be in the room. They are not going to be elected into the National Academy of Medicine or Engineering or, or and then <laughs> the people making recommendations to our government are the members of the National Academies, right? So the, this little thing that we say that we fund brown and black scholars really feeds into the issue that you highlight here. We cannot diversify any of the power uh, structure if we're not getting them through. Okay, the quick thing to do is to dismantle the way that we make selections for those leadership positions and, and panels, uh, the NIH councils. We need to just think about different ways of, of uh, staffing them and, and prioritizing diversity. We yeah. talked about the COVID-19 vaccine and the recommendation that the Academy made in terms of who should be in line for the vaccination. We have data that is clear as daylight that more black and brown people are dying of the, vac uh, of the disease, of the virus. They are twice as likely to die, yet, we as a nation could not muster up the courage to prioritize vaccine based on that. Our Northern neighbor Canada did that. They vaccinated their indigenous communities first because of data. So 
Well, I couldn't agree more. So let me, I'm going to maybe, you know, ask questions back and forth between the, the journey part and, and the, the latter part. So we can start with a, a journey question I'd like. Um, your journey highlights a lot of uh, early serendipitous occurrences, going to UMBC, finding a mentor that was great, <laughs> finding an undergraduate research experience. What are the deliberate or more purposeful things an institution can do to ensure that these opportunities happen more systemically uh, for uh, African American students and, and uh, you know a more diverse set of students who come from backgrounds such as your own? Yeah, I think the programs that exist for research, undergraduate research experience, and there's a lot of programs that are focused on minority students. Here is the problem that you know we're still stuck in this mindset of recommendation letters, right? And so many, someone like me, if you had somebody write me a recommendation letter from my community college days, they would say that I was a bum. I was hanging out in the cafeteria with boys because I had no motivation. And so any recommendation letter was going to keep me out of any of those programs. So we cannot find that next Lola, right? by doing the same kinds of things that filter out, the kinds of things that are built off of privilege, right? And this is the same thing when we want to bring PhD students to come meet us to talk about academia. We're trying to convince this black and brown people to stay in an environment that they have felt hostile to them. And then we're asking them for recommendation letter. What do we want to learn from that letter that we cannot see from their CV? or their publication. So again, there are ways, the money is there, the programs are there, we need to just restructure them so that we're not ending up shooting ourselves in the foot. My son is applying to university and I was horrified to go through this process that took, took us weeks of hours, essentially, from two involved parents who, with high privilege and, and it really horrified is my, you know, is the right adjective. When I think about kids and, and it says right there, they're gonna judge you on your grammar, your punctuation. And I think in letters of recommendation, I think what if, who are we cutting out by, by this application could not be more obvious. And it's from our institutions that are supposed to be the leaders. And I've been writing so many emails on this and this kind of privilege just has to be dealt with immediately, mm -hmm. just like what you're saying. And I think us, the privileged white people, like in these simple examples, we have to change the structure of our, our, our university admissions, really think through this, what we're asking for and the impacts of what we're asking for and the immediate screening implications for this kind of application is just insane. Uh, I have to ask a question because there's one from a fellow Meyerhoff <laughs> scholar. Uh, and they ask, uh, they, they are a UMBC alumnus, a Meyerhoff scholar in graduate school. And they ask at what level do you think it's most critical for getting, this would be diverse students, uh, say black students, African American students, Latino students uh, interested in a scientific career and uh, being transformed and maybe in the kind of way you were through your experiences. What level? And that's a great question. I didn't connect with research until my um, uh, junior year at UNBC. So it's never too late. I think one of the mistakes that we've made over the years is this concentration of all the effort at K through 12. There's value to that. But again, we're just jamming this pipeline that has a major plug somewhere. Eventually the thing bursts open and everybody leaves, right? So I think it's less about, yes, we lose every step of the way, but there is, we are underestimating the impact of the visual, right? When people, even from afar, can see somebody they look like them, it communicates interest. And that then interest met with available programs, you can get more and more people interested in research, right? So of course, communicating those options and availability sooner than later helps. 
Um, and there are many programs, again, that exist in many of our universities. Again, we just need to rethink how we're leveraging those programs to make sure we're getting the people. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Uh, you know, this is an area where there can be tension. I think sometimes this question, next question here, and I, I, I think this is, again, a, a forum where we're meant to have respectful and uh, but candid conversations. And, you know, it's, it's one that I, I, I've seen recently, a conversation, you know, do you have ideas for lessons learned for dismantling the barriers against black scientists that may also help improve uh, other minoritized groups or even say first generation. And the tension I've seen around this is people begin to see it as a competition rather than we need to, you know, raise uh, the level of, uh, of water for everybody. But, but what, so, what might you say there? Gloria? Yeah, so, so the, here's my response to that. It is true that everybody has some level of suffering, especially when they are in the minority. But the people at the bottom of the, the bottom are the black people. They are at the bottom and they suffer the most from COVID-19, uh, wealth disparity, gaps in the uh, Latinx are just above them. The uh, Native American uh, are somewhere in between those two. Um, and so you are correct that it should not be a competition. And the example I give here is in the pandemic, we've all agreed that the most vulnerable people should get the vaccine first. There is not a mass demonstration against giving our 80 year old vaccines. And we understand that protecting them eventually protects us. But only when we're talking about race, that this logical concept does not make sense to us. Protect your most vulnerable, okay? The weakest of us, you gotta take care of them. When you do that, you take care of everybody. If the black and brown communities were taken care of, we would have been out of this pandemic sooner than we are. We are stuck now and potentially for another year. So I say work with us to get the people most in need taken care of. And by doing so, everybody now have time to take care of the next level. So it's not a competition, it should be a collaboration. Well, I hope you can read the some of the questions and answers because you're getting a lot of rightfully beautiful comments about how inspiring you are, Lola, and, and how important your voice is. So I'll just start with that part because I've kind of been leaving it out. Sorry. Thanks for the inspiration and the work. My question, uh, I see that you've had really great mentors on your path. How would you suggest that young scientists uh, be intentional in seeking mentors? I'd say the first thing is to be open-minded. Um, I think I just, by, for better or worse, did not have the conceived notions when I just kind of fell into every step. And so then, because I was open-minded, when I did get opportunities to be mentored, it was, it was obvious to me. Uh, the other piece I would say is to not hide, okay? I think, I, I know that the environment is hot. And every time I go to a scientific conference, I want to hide. I want to stay in my hotel room because every time I go into a talk, I'm one of two in most conferences in my field. And it is scary and it is mental stress. But I get myself up and give myself that pep talk and I go out. So in some ways, if you made a commitment to be in academia, to be in a PhD program, make yourself available. Ask. I always say to people, when you don't ask, that's a 0% chance of a yes. By asking, you improve your chance 50-50 already, right? So speak up, ask. The worst thing that can happen to you is they say no. Then you go to the next person. And so that's what I would say. It's to just be, leave yourself open to be able to find that mentor and, and, and don't be fixated that your mentor has to look a certain way. You can always learn uh, from people. Uh, I learn from my son who's 11 all the time. And I make myself open to be mentored by him. Well, 
I think that's a great place to end. And I would just add, I, I always remember that Tyrone Porter, when he was speaking too, said that seek multiple mentors, right? And that's something I give all my students the advice of, you know, you don't, the last person, single person you depend on is me. You, you really want multiple voices, multiple mentors, and for, for, you know, immediate reasons of getting great advice, but, you know, getting a diversity, uh, of advice. And I, I, I think when I looked at your slides, that really settled into me about how many mentors uh, that, that you had, uh, Lola. And, and I, I think that's good, good advice for younger people too. But uh, I think our time is up for today. We're going to have to have you back. This is a continuing series. And uh, we, we would actually love to, I'm sure, follow up um, in, in many ways uh, uh, next year when we continue our series too. Thank you again from, you know, just the deepest part of our hearts. Lola, you, you really shared yourself and um, such important research for our field and for all of STEM today. So thank you so much. It's great to see you um, by Zoom and I'll look forward to seeing you live sometime, hopefully this year. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Bye.